the real threats will come from China, Russia, Iran, and they'll come as SQL injections and malware. SQL injection, an attack allowing an attacker to interface with SQL database lookup queries, which can result in the viewing or modification of database data, and in some cases, remote code execution. A database, in this sense, orders data into tables, like an Excel table, with rows and columns, such as keeping track of students in a class, their name and allergies, or user accounts to log into an application. Mobile has some security. They require a username password combo, and I'm going to go ahead and say they don't have access to the main FAS user database, so they have no way of detecting an intrusion. So how do we talk to the database? SQL, also known as Structured Query Language, is the go-to system used to communicate with databases such as MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, and Oracle, each with their own variations on the SQL syntax. Let's take a look at how SQL works. SQL uses an almost human-like syntax. It uses keywords to build up what is called a statement or query. The first part of the statement is the keyword action, which will be the action performed. The most common is the select keyword, which is used to select or retrieve some data. I gotta draw it in. Next, we state what the keyword will perform against. I want my jar of dirt. For example, we want to select or retrieve the username column and the password column, separated by a comma. Finally, we need to tell the database where to pull that column from. And in this case, we use the from keyword. So altogether, we tell the database we want to select, meaning retrieve, the username and password column from table name, which in this case is the user table. The database will look in its user table for the columns username and password. If it exists in the database, it will then return it to our user. Are you username ladies man 217? Here I have a table of data containing some usernames and passwords. Let's use live SQL queries to get it. Here we have the user table. It has four columns, ID, username, password, and age. You may recognize this from the animation I did previously. Notice here we have a query, select star from user table. The star in this case represents all which in this case will select all data from the user table. Let's replicate the query from the animation. Select minimum retrieve, the columns, username and password, from user table, hit go, and the data is returned. Let's update the query to only retrieve the username column. Let's say we only want certain data. We can use the where clause to perform this, so we can specify what kind of data we want based on some parameter. The above query does a search for the username and age from the user table. We can tell the database we only want certain rows of data where an age is a certain value. In this case, age equal to 18. It's good math. This also works with greater than and less than symbols too. This is important as many applications will give the user control of this where clause, online shopping for example. So if we control the query, we may be able to tag on additional SQL. Let's take a look at another operator, which is called union, which effectively allows us to bunch our queries together. This query returns one row of data. We can use the union operator to add additional data to our query. In this case, select and then two columns. We use two columns as the original query has two columns too, so we must match the number of columns in the query. I use two strings in this case. The result includes our additional query. Please sub to Sakura. I approve of this union. Let's now dump additional database table information. I created an additional table called secret table with a column of secret. We need to match the number of columns, so I use null as a placeholder and then secret as the column name from the secret table, which then dumps the secret information. This query will select the ID, username and password from the database. Let's say we want the admin user. We append on where username equals admin. We need to quote admin as it's a string. We can use double or single quotes for this. We can append additional conditions to our where clause using the or keyword. In this case, we use ID equals two to get the second row of data. As can be observed, it returns the admin and the ID of two. We can also try with an ID of three. We can use additional logic too. For example, rather than ID equals three, we could actually say all one equals one, meaning all true, which would dump everything as it is a true statement. Okay, Jarvis, you know, I want it all. Let's now discuss the importance of special characters. This query mimics logging into an application. If the username and password match in the database, it will then return the row of data. But what if we don't know the username or password? We can use special combinations of characters to form an SQL comment, effectively allowing us to comment the rest of the query out. Different flavors of SQL have different ways of commenting, but they're all generally the same. We are using MySQL, 
So we can use hashtag hyphen hyphen space or forward slash asterisk for a line comment. We run the query as standard and get no rows of data back. Let's leverage comments to bypass this. We insert a MySQL comment or a hashtag into the admin string. No rows of data are returned. This is because the comment is inside the string and therefore it's being treated as a string character and not a hashtag comment. Let's add a single tick before the hashtag. Notice the rest of the query goes yellow. This is saying it's been commented out. Therefore, our password condition within the WHERE clause is no longer present. Therefore, we no longer require it. Submitting the query returns one row of data based on our condition of where username equals admin, therefore not including the password. Therefore, we have bypassed this requirement. Nice. Now we understand the theory, let's actually go and test it on a live web app vulnerable to SQL injection and see how far we can get. This web application allows the user to look up student names based on the allergies, such as nuts. We see that our input has been fed into the SQL query and the names have been returned. Making a search for an alternate allergy, such as dairy, gives me a different response for Michael Scott. You can see this reflected in the query. Next, we take a look at the MySQL backend, and we can see the student table showing their names and associated allergies. Special characters are important when coding. Quotes can be used to quote strings, commas can be used to make a list, or even combination of characters, such as a hyphen, hyphen plus, can be used to comment the rest of a line of code out. So what happens if the application processes our special characters? The results can be deadly. Here, I inject a single quote, causing an error, as the quote has been processed as part of the query, which has created an uneven number of quotes, as can be seen in the SQL query line here. Next, I use the OR keyword following the newly added quote to create a second condition to our allergy search. In this case, we set it to true, which won't work, but we can instead use a true statement, such as one equals one, and an extra quote to balance out the quotes, causing the query to evaluate as select all names where allergy is dairy or true which evaluates to get all names from the database. Now we understand the use of injecting SQL syntax into a query, we can now use this to bypass authentication. We use tsmith's credentials to log in as intended and work backwards. Now we have logged in, let's make the password wrong, so we can demonstrate the bypassing of the password field using a comment. We add a single quote and see that an error is thrown. What we can do next, in this case, is to add a hyphen hyphen plus to comment the rest of the query out, meaning the password is not validated. Next, we use our knowledge of the one equals one true condition to log in as any user we want to. In this example, the blue box prints out all the users. SQL will take the first result as the user we log into, in this case T Smith. However, we can use the limit clause to offset it by two, so we log in as Cleo, or three, and log in as Michael Scott. No God! No God! Please no! 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 Now we have explored authentication bypassing, let's take a look at dumping the backend database using union-based SQL injection. The first step of a union-based injection is often to work out how many columns are returned from the query and the associated data types. This is important as when we do the union injection we need to match the number of columns in the query to our union query. We use order by one and comment the rest out to avoid error. There should be at least one column to order by so we shouldn't get an error. We then use order by two, meaning order by two columns, which throws an error, as it can't order by a column that doesn't exist, therefore implying there is only one column, and we jot this down in our notes. Next, we replace the order by with a union select null. We use null as it won't cause field data type errors. Let's you try a string, and that works too. We can use MySQL's concat function to concatenate two fields together, allowing us to extract more than one column or string at a time. Next, we dump useful MySQL data so we can understand the database more. We use the database function to dump the database name, version, and current user and note it down. We also dump the current directory. This is useful for later when getting a reverse shell. Let's now investigate dumping the database to get the usernames and passwords. The information schema.tables table houses all the table names. We can select the table names from here. Therefore, we use union select table name from information schema.tables and that then gives us all the tables. The output was a little noisy, so we use the WHERE clause to specify the previously retrieved database students, so we only get the tables we care about. We are then given the appropriate table names of accounts, profile, and students. We add these to the notes. Next, we get the columns of the table we want. In this case, accounts. We adjust the query from dot tables to dot columns, set the table name to accounts, and change the table name to column name, disclosing the username and password column to us. We take the information we have gathered and dump the usernames. Then we use a concat to dump the passwords too. Now we have explored dumping the database, let's explore exploiting the system by creating a PHP-based backdoor on the system allowing us to execute commands. It's a shell game now. We conduct this via SQL selecting some PHP code that when run would execute shell commands. 
and writing it out to a file in the public web directory using the into out file MySQL functionality. We then visit the location of this PHP file and provide an arbitrary command of dir which will list the current directory, thus proving we have remote code execution. Let's now take a look at blind SQL injection. This web application is different to the previous one as it only outputs two responses based on if the search allergy exists or not. If the allergy doesn't exist, we get a no data returned response. If it does exist, we get a response stating students with allergies found. Adding an S to the NUT string returns the no data returned response, as NUTs of two S's doesn't exist. Next, we insert some single ticks to cause an error, but all we get is no data returned, meaning we have no visibility over SQL errors, which we previously used to guide the SQL injection. We can, however, use the no data return response as this errored symbol in the back end and the students with allergies found response as proof that the query did an error and also we can use this to validate conditions, but more on this soon. Here we use our knowledge of breaking out of the query and add a single tick, followed by an OR. This gives us an error, but adding a single tick bounces out the query ticks, so it does an error. We can replace the end single tick with a comment to comment that last tick out if we want to submit an integer. Here we try nuts and one meaning if nuts and 1 are true, then return rows of data. If we try nuts and 0, we get 0 results, as both sides must be true for data to be returned. Let's add a 1 equals 1 on the far right side. We replace nuts with an allergy that doesn't exist, such as the word subscribe, and update it to an OR operator, meaning because the left side is false, if anything on the right side is true, we will then get a true response. Therefore, we can work off the back of this to determine if variables within the database are true but we can actually escalate this to be select 1 equals 1 and get the same result. We demonstrate this working by doing select 1 equals 2 and then select 2 equals 2 or select 1 times 2 equals 2. Since we can select data, we can also select variable data like function calls, column names, table names, etc. In this example, we select the database function, which will give us the name of the database. In this case, we simply do select database, database doesn't equal 2, so we get no data returned. We replace 2 with the database function and see we actually get a valid response. We switch to the standard SQL injection page, shown in the previous demo. I've done this so you can see the name of the database beforehand, so we can compare it against our database function to prove this works. Off the back of this, students is the name of the database. When compared to our blind SQL injection query, we can see we get a valid response the word students. In reality, we wouldn't know the name of the database is called students. So we want to methodically extract each letter at a time and guess what it may be. For example, is the first letter S? Yes, it is. Is the second letter T? Yes, it is. We can use the substring function to do this for us, but we must first tell substring at what character we want, so the first character, and how many characters we want it to run from, one character, so it gives us one letter at the first index of the string. We increment this number for each character we want to enumerate. Character one of students is the letter S. Changing this to the second character and t gives us a good result, meaning this is working. We can also tell the substring function to take the first two characters, so for example st. In this case we update our substring to equal st and we get a good response, showing this has worked. And so on for the rest of the characters. In normal cases this can be a slow process, having to enumerate manually each character at a certain index of a string. We can use burp suite to automate this for us. Simply in this case, all we are doing is we are intercepting the request, meaning catching it on the fly, and putting it in a tool which will allow us to brute force all of the characters. I will go into more depth into this in a future video. Here we pass the request to Intruder, our brute force tool. We tell Burp what areas we want to brute force, which in this case is E letter, and the payload to use, in this case A to Z, and hit run. We sort by length and it shows the S is a valid response, therefore the first letter is an S. We do the same for the second letter, t, which gives us st. This basic example isn't feasible at scale. Let's automate this using Python. We import the request modules for HTTP requests, define a function brute, paste the injection string for reference, create a for loop to loop over all alphanumeric characters, print out the basic query, convert our letter value to its character equivalent, and finally call the function, which prints our payload with all character combinations. Assign the value of the print statement to the payload variable, create the request object, and create a condition which will check if students is in the response. If so, we print the letter. Next, we extract the URL from the page. Following every keystroke, the front end makes a request to an API. We extract this from the network tools and load it into our Python script by extracting the URL and the query string and pasting into the request object and appending our payload string, which gets generated dynamically 
we hit run and see the program has dumped the first letter of the string, s. Next we dump the second letter of the string, t. This is still clunky. To speed this up, we will make a for loop, which will iterate over every character in the string. The logic behind this is that if a good response is returned, then the characters will be added to a string, which will be printed out and slowly dump the entire string. We define the word variable to store the word. We write a for loop to iterate over every character in the word, indent the below code, add every successful character to the word, print the word, break the for loop so the next position in the string is used. Replace the statically assigned offset with the dynamic loop dating offset, so it will iterate over every character. Run the code and observe the script automatically dump the entire string of students. Now the script is working, we want to dump the table name. This is a case of manipulating the existing SQL query to select different data instead. This is a little bit long, but really what it's asking for is a table name from the information schema. This particular string is made for the Python code, so we will have to go ahead and replace those variable references. In this case, we replace row offset with one, meaning give us the first row, and the char offset with one also, giving us the first character. The reason we need the row offset is because when we select the table names from the database, it gives us three rows of data, which messes with the query. So we must add a limit clause so it only gives us one row of data. Changing the equals to a P gives us a valid response, meaning this is working. As previously demonstrated, we migrate this over to BERT suite so we can brute force all the individual characters to prove this is working. As can be observed, we can see the PR for the word profile. Now we migrate to our code. All we need to do in this case is simply just replace our existing query with the modified one and adjust a few parameters. We paste our query and manipulate it so it contains the variable names, simply replacing the P with the character or letter, the substring offset with the character offset, and override our existing query, and escaping all single ticks so the query works properly within the Python code. We update the row limit to zero so we get the first row. Then we run the Python code, which dumps the accounts table from the database. Next, we want to dump the columns from the accounts table. We simply just replace some pieces in the query to achieve this. As there are multiple columns in the accounts table, we update the limit clause iteratively to get them all. This simply just offsets the row ID. We eventually arrive at username and password. Retrieving the username and password is quite simple. Again, just manipulating the existing SQL query. But we simply ask for the username from the accounts table. This doesn't work originally though, that is because we haven't added the limit clause. Look at our normal SQL injection and see this is why. Therefore, we need to add the limit clause to fix this. And we also clean up the query by removing leftover brackets. Now this is working, we migrate the SQL injection string to our code. Hit run and see the first value of the database get provided to us. Update the offset and see the second value of the database get provided to us. Now that's working, we want to dump the username and the password. Simply, we use a concat function previously shown in the demo. As can be observed, the username Cleo and her password Poisonous has been displayed. Congratulations. You know one step closer to being a web hacker. Join me in my next episode, series, to learn more, develop, grow, and become the best web hacker. Oh, and like and subscribe. That'd be super helpful. Thanks.